What a fantastic day. Um, I want to begin my talk with a story of two girls, Fatima and Rokia, two simple village girls who were married off at a very young age. They conceived within a year, and they both had features of high-risk pregnancy, and they were both asked to conduct their delivery at a facility. Fatima and her family chose to have their delivery at home in the presence of an untrained, unskilled worker they called Dai. Um, she had prolonged labor and uh, several bouts of intense hemorrhage right after she gave birth to her child. Um, it, the bleeding was so intense, in fact, it shot down a very important hormone-producing gland in our brain called the pituitary. And uh, she was bedridden and debilitated several months after, and her baby was deprived of her mother. Rokia, on the other hand, she chose to deliver her child at a facility. She too bled, but she survived. It was well managed by the qualified physicians and midwives there. And uh, she was able to breastfeed her baby and make sure that her baby was well nourished. These two girls hailed from the same village. They had the same socioeconomic status. They were matched age for age, except for a subtle difference. Both had different educational backgrounds. The Fatima never went a day to school. Rokia was married right after SSC examinations. Single stories like these are mere anecdotes for us researchers, but when you compile a raft of such stories as part of qualitative research, their accounts become compelling. And uh, time and again, it has been shown that maternal health-seeking behavior is strongly influenced by her educational status. And it is what profoundly affected the choices made by these two seemingly similar rural women. The butterfly effect of small changes, the term was actually first coined by Edward Lorenz to explain the unpredictability of weather patterns. It was also used as a common trope of fiction. There's a movie named after it. But nonetheless, the, um, the way I like to see it is that it's, it explains how a larger set of events come to play as a result of small changes made in the past as a, across time and space. And I allude to this because of a policy decision made in the early 90s by our government caused a cascade of ripple effect that resonates with us even to this day. But before I talk of that, I'd like to show you all a picture. And I want you to tell me the first country that comes to your mind when you see this. Africa. Yes, most of the time it is Africa. The country is Africa. And <laughs> the fact of the matter is that in 1997, Professor Ramalinga Swami and colleagues published a scathing report dispelling this common preconceived notion we have about the entirety of the world's malnourished children residing in this continent. But well, according to his research, more than half, 50% of the world's malnourished children actually reside in just three countries, Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan. And the figure for even the poorest countries of sub-Saharan Africa is about 30%. Um, and all of this despite having the same purchasing power as Africa, and that was intriguing. It intrigued them. They called it the Asian Enigma. But I don't want to talk about that today. What I would like to talk about is the other Asian Enigma. Literally, the title of a paper released today, uh, published by the International Food Policy Research Institute, authored by Derek Hady, John Hardena, the folks that I work with. And according to them, the majority of South Asian literature has largely ignored Bangladesh sustained success in combating the scourge of undernutrition and poverty. According to their research, Bangladesh uh, has had the fastest prolonged reduction in childhood underweight and stunting in the last two decades, from 1997 to 2011. We have had the fastest decline in the world, uh, just narrowly behind the much more celebrated case of Thailand in the 80s, but well ahead of several success stories of Brazil, Mexico, and Honduras. Bangladesh now has lower stunting rates than India and Pakistan, despite both these countries having higher mean incomes and spending more on their people for health than we spend on ours. <laughs> the authors of this paper were baffled, and they set out to find why. They performed what we call a regression analysis, basically looking at the various rounds of demographic and health survey data and trying to figure out what we did right. But it, as it turns out, there was a program that was started in the early 90s. Um, according to them, the factors behind Bangladesh's massive success was multidimensional, but one thing that really stood out was a conditional cash transfer initiative that was started by the government in the early 90s. It was called the Female Secondary School Stipend Program. And according to this program, in order for the girl to be eligible for the stipend, she has to have at least 75% attendance in her class. 
She has to secure at least 45% marks in her annual examinations, and she has to remain unmarried for the entire duration of her secondary education. The program was so successful that today in Bangladesh, girls outnumber boys in secondary schools. <laughs> education happens to be in everyone's best interests, but nobody's responsibility. It's quite obvious if you think about it that you'd have to study up until the eighth grade to become a peon, an orderly, but you don't need any to run the country. That we would rather spend more on our daughter's, daughter's uh, weddings than on our well-being or her education. What we need to know is that education empowers women. It instills in them the good sense to make the right choices for not only for themselves, but for our nation's posterity. Uh, health, the health and nutritional state of a child, boy or girl, is a reflection of the health and nutritional status of the mother during her childhood, adolescence, pregnancy, puberty, and pregnancy. And the fate of the nation's posterity isn't written on stars. It's decided that mother is born. Uh, I'd like to show you a couple of charts. And uh, 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 one thing that I would like to tell you before I show them, um, I just displayed them, uh, that correlation is not causation. Even though you see a strong association, it does not mean this caused this. But nonetheless, let's just keep that in mind while we take these with a grain of salt. This is a graph um, showing the association between female education and life expectancy of both males and females. What you need to focus on is, are the blue dots. And as you can see, the blue dots are clustered around the right top-hand side of the chart. And it shows that both uh, these indicators are directly proportional to each other, that female, a rise in female education is linked to, is very strongly linked, in fact, to a rise in life expectancy of both these sexes. And Bangladesh remains among the top of those countries alongside Nepal. This is a chart uh, showing the link. Uh, actually, this is a very complicated chart. You just need to focus on two lines here, the blue line and the orange line. This is a chart spanning from 1970 to 2010. And the, the blue line is the maternal mortality rate, another one of the indicators that we have had the fastest declines. We plummeted it down by, from 1970 to 2010 by a very, very high number. And you can see a parallel rise in life expectancy, which is represented by the orange line. The other lines subsequently reflect both the results of these indicators. They are the plummets of under five mortality rates, the neonatal mortality rates, and the, under, the, uh, the, neonatal, uh, the infant mortality rates. This next shot simply reiterates what I just said. I'm not sure if you're able to see, but there's Bangladesh, Ethiopia, India, Kenya, Nigeria, Pakistan, Peru, and Zambia on these charts. It's a, it's a graph depicting the, uh, the stunting prevalence in these countries for the last two decades and how they changed. There's a white line that crosses all the other lines. It has the steepest slope. That is Bangladesh. So the authors of the paper, the other Asian enigma, uh, Derek and John, uh, were gracious enough to permit me to use their charts. And uh, uh, the outer circle represents Bangladesh. The inner one represents Nepal. You don't need to focus on that. Bangladesh. So as you can see, what they tried to find out is what factors contributed to the, this massive reduction of stunting. And by the way, stunting is one of the best indicators of chronic undernutrition in a country. So their purpose was to find out what factors led to this massive decline in stunting rates. And what they found was more than 26% of the stunting prevalence decline was act can actually be attributed to parental education. They broke this indicator down to mother's education and father's education. And as it turns out, 15%, the orange bar, as you can see on the right side, is actually mother's education. It's more than the 11%, which is father's education. So they combined mother's education with her height, and they created a new indicator called women's human capital. And as you can see, it, contributes about 20, it has contributed about 25% of the reduction of stunting in Bangladesh and Nepal. So, before I go to the next slide, I want to go back a little bit when our country first achieved independence. There were many people who said that we couldn't survive as a sovereign nation. We, couldn't, we wouldn't survive as an independent state. One of those naysayers was this person, Mr. Henry Kissinger, the 56th United States Secretary of State. Even after our independence uh, on 1971, he said that Bangladesh is a country without hope, a basket case. And uh, it was truly as resonated by Rosie Hurst, we are not a basket case and we are a beacon, in fact. And the point is, this was according to The Economist, one famine, three military coups, and four catastrophic floods later, 
the, the country that Mr. Kissinger dismissed as a mere basket case is still a test, but no longer in the sense of being the bare minimum that other countries should seek to surpass. Today, according to The Economist, Bangladesh is a standard for other developing countries to live up to. <laughs> that said, the most important part of the country's achievement can serve as a model for others. Bangladesh shows what happens if you take women seriously as agents of development. <laughs> Economist 2012. Last year, one of the oldest and most powerful medical journals, The Lancet, published an entire case series on Bangladesh. Uh, to investigate what they called one of the great mysteries of global health. The first of their papers was authored by Professor Mushtaq Reza Chaudhry, the current vice chairperson of BRAC, and um, um, uh, the paper was titled The Bangladesh Paradox, Exceptional Health Achievements Despite Economic Poverty, and this was one of their statements. Bangladesh has made enormous health advances and now has the longest life expectancy, lowest fertility rate, and lowest infant and under five mortality rates in South Asia, despite spending less on healthcare than several neighboring countries. In response to the paper, one of India's leading economists, uh, Omorto Shen, had this to say, the unlocking of the power of women's active role in the society and the economy has been an extremely productive move for Bangladesh, despite having half the per capita income of India. So good. It's a it's, uh, it's really good thing. It's a good news that we are ahead of several other countries. But now I want to give you some bad news. The bad news is that about 30% of children born to mothers, even with secondary education, remain malnourished. That even though we have cut down the stunting prevalence from 61% to 41% in just a span of a few years, it's still 41%. It is still inappropriately high. It still puts us at the level, uh, uh, ranks us among the top 10 countries with the highest burden of this scourge. Gender-centered interventions are extremely powerful, as has been shown. But what we needed is a paradigm shift. We needed to look at this, we needed to take an approach that is wholesome, that was holistic. Transform Nutrition. It's a consortium of some of the world's leading minds in health, economics, and nutrition. It was, it's funded by the United, uh, the United Kingdom Department for International Development to address one specific question. How can we inspire effective action against undernutrition and accelerate our progress? Well, that we have three pillars. Nutrition-specific interventions, nutrition-sensitive interventions, and enabling environment. The stuff that I've been talking about so far is part of the pillar two, nutrition-sensitive interventions. The nutrition-specific interventions are, for example, providing prenatal supplementation, complementary feed supplementation, encouraging the mothers to breastfeed, um, et cetera. The, the, the curious thing about nutrition-specific measures was that an economic analysis was done on how, what the return of investment will be. For every one dollar we invest in reducing the stunting prevalence by using nutrition-specific measures, we get a return of investment of $18. As that's, that's not even putting nutrition-sensitive interventions to the mix. The third pillar, perhaps the most important pillar, is enabling environment, which is basically creating the right type of environment where the impact of these two interventions, nutrition-specific and sensitive, can be maximized. The overarching purpose of our research group is to uh, gather and collect high-level, strong, grade-A evidence to shape national and global policies on health and nutrition um, and accelerate our progress to the ranks of first world nations, perhaps by the end of the next decade. This, I am admittedly a dreamer, but this is not a dream. It's a vision as tangible as you or I and a sacred aspiration. The road to hell, they say, is paved with good intentions, but heaven apparently lies beneath their feet. Ken Robinson, an educationalist and perhaps one of the most celebrated TED speakers of all time, said, that education's meant to take us to the future we can't grasp. The future of our country and perhaps of the world, my friends, lie, begin with her, within her. Thank you.